This is episode 97 of the Death to Tyrants podcast. The crushing weight of the tyrant's passage had left nothing unmarked. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmically equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. What is going on, you guys? And, uh... The answer to that is probably a lot different than it would have been just a few days ago or a few weeks ago. This is the Death to Tyrants podcast, and as always, I am still here. I am still your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson, coming to you from Austin, Texas. Austin, Texas, that is not yet locked down under martial law. Of course, things change not only by the day, but really by the hour and minute with this coronavirus craziness. So when this drops, maybe things will be much different. And that's kind of the theme of this particular episode is that things will be much different when this is all said and done. So I guess I can explain this at this point. I had a bunch of other topics and guests lined up through April, basically. And I kind of had to switch all of that around because in the midst of what is basically the craziest moment I've ever witnessed. Probably many of you would agree with that. You probably don't want to hear about abstract libertarian theory. So I'm going to be focusing several episodes now on the coronavirus and not just specifically the medical aspect of it, but I want to hit it from all different angles because like I said, it's the craziest thing I've ever seen. And so I think we can uh, kind of walk through this and take different angles, come at it from different perspectives. And that's what I want to do. Of course, we can always keep a libertarian view here. And that's what we will do. And I will tell you that as I read through article after article, the theme I kept having in my own mind is that things have changed. And we're not going back to what some people call normalcy after this. On the other side of this, it will never look like it did before. And we saw that a little bit with 9-11, certainly the security infrastructure within the federal government and airport travel and, and that kind of stuff never went back to how it was before. I think we are headed for even bigger, more drastic changes uh, than that. And the other side of this is going to look a lot different. So with that theme in mind, You know, I'm reading articles, like I said, on this, and I find one by our guest today, James Howard Kunstler, uh, over there on lewrockwell.com, and it was called Things Have Changed. And it almost put me, uh, I don't know, it was like this feeling of peace washed over me as I read it, because not only was I going, this is kind of what I've been thinking, and and, uh, James just kind of articulates it better than I could in my own mind, but uh, he's always got a kind of a comical twist on some of his wording. And I think you'll appreciate that too. Of course, I'll link to that uh, article in the show notes page for this. So we're going to get into all of that. Let me tell you real quick about James Howard Kunstler. He's been on the show before, so you probably remember him. I got lots of positive feedback from that episode. Of note that you'll remember, he used to write for Rolling Stone magazine. He's got many books out. He's an author, writer. He's done lecturing. He's got a podcast. He's got a blog that he puts out several times a week. Of course, you can find that all over at Kunstler.com, K-U-N-S-T-L-E-R.com. Without further ado, let's bring him on in. James Howard Kunstler, welcome back to Death to Tyrants, man. I'm glad to have you. Hi, Buck. It's nice to talk to you. Yeah, man. It's. Uh, <laughs> I wish it was under slightly different circumstances. but uh, Yeah, like if we were uh, standing on a patio holding a cocktail or something. That would be much better, yeah. Six feet away, of course. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> These days, it would be nice to go back to normal times and do it in a normal way, but we ain't doing that, so uh, here we are. Yeah, uh, well, before we jump into that craziness, remind the folks where you are and what you normally do when you're not basically, I, I guess, quarantined. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, in some ways, my life is uh, in quarantine because... Uh, You know, I work for myself. I'm a writer. I I write books. I've published about 23 books. And, you know, some of them we may talk about today. They've been, you know, I've written a bunch of books about the uh, collapse of 
industrial economy. And um, I live in a little, I live at the edge of a little factory village in the most extreme eastern part of upstate New York. I'm about 10 miles from the Vermont border and about four miles from the Hudson River and about 40 miles north of Albany. And, um, you know, I do my thing here. I'm on a little homestead with chickens and uh, gardens and fruit trees and berry bushes. Anyway, that's my life. You know, I get up and I write books. I write a blog twice a week on Monday and Friday. And I do a podcast every three weeks or so. And um, that's how I roll. So uh, there you have it. I think uh, if I remember from last time, you play music too, don't you? Oh, yeah, I do. Um, I play in three different musical groups or bands. I play in a contra dance band, which is basically, you know, old time line dancing and a lot of Celtic uh, tunes and old English tunes and Appalachian old time tunes. And I play guitar and fiddle and I play rock and roll on Wednesday nights with the, with the boys and sing, or as you might say, sang. <laughs> and, uh, on Thursday nights I play in a Celtic jam band at a brew pub in the next town over. So that's, yeah. And, you know, that's all suspended now, like everything else. Right. I am spending a lot of time at home doing music in the absence of other things. And I, um, I hauled the electric piano out of the, uh, out of the man cave in the basement and brought it up to the living room. And I've, I've gotten back to my piano study that I kind of dropped 20 years ago. So I'm back to, uh, doing the, you know, pretty fundamental, uh, Bach pieces and a little simple, Scott Joplin and reading, uh, you know, reading notation again and relearning bass clef. So that's been my life up here for the last week or so. Yeah, that's that's a kind of an interesting transition because that's kind of an analog for, I think a lot of people are saying they're kind of getting back to quote unquote roots or figuring out things that have, their life seems to have maybe gotten too complicated for and kind of stepping back. Uh, for a moment. Well, I'm at no loss of things to do, that's for sure. Yeah, we're the same here. Uh, I've got plenty of books to read, uh, at least. Let's jump into this because it's the weirdest thing I've uh, kind of been, I've witnessed in my lifetime, honestly. I don't know. Me too. Yeah, well. I mean, it's weird. It's very weird. And I'm trying to read articles every day, trying to come at it from as many different angles as I as I can. And the one phrase I kept thinking, and I still keep thinking, happened to be the phrase that you titled your article, and that's, things have changed. And it seems like, I don't know that uh, people keep saying, well, in a few weeks or a few months when we get back to normalcy, they keep using that word. And I don't think you're getting back to what was normal. I think there's kind of going to be a new normal. And the line that drew me in immediately to your article you always say things so cleverly, is that uh, at least in wartime, the bars stay open. And that's how you know this is a different thing altogether than anything else you've seen in your lifetime. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. In the immortal words of the uh, former uh, heavyweight champion, Leon Spinks, it's freaky deaky. Yeah, (laughs) That's, that's another clever way to put it. Uh, I love. I also love the Heming, Hemingway line that you referenced, and it's about the guy that went broke. It was slowly, slowly, and then all at once, and that kind of seems. Yeah, and then, by the way, you know, everybody and their uncle has been uh, hauling out that line for the last few years. Every time things do get a little freaky deaky out there, so you know, I'm not the most original uh, mind out there, but that was a good line, and it it does kind of say it all about uh, exactly what's happening with the phony baloney uh, financial sector of our of our world. Yeah. And then you referenced the debate and I, I watched that as well. Biden against Bernie Sanders the other night. Uh, Bernie's on stage literally proposing the health care that they have in Italy right now. And, you know, Biden, I guess, for all of his faults, at least was cogent enough to point out the irony in that right now, it's, it's, you put it, it was like the inadequate versus the irrelevant. And uh, what yeah. were your thoughts on all of that? Oh, uh, well, on Biden, um, I'm actually going to write about this tomorrow, probably. Uh, it'll probably come out before you even publish your podcast. But 
Biden is an extraordinarily weak candidate and in many ways a weak human being. And he communicates that uh, pretty clearly to the public. And, you know, the degree to which the Democratic Party is having to strenuously pretend otherwise is really another remarkable thing I've seen in my lifetime. I I mean, they might as well put a, a ventriloquist dummy up there. You know, on the other hand, you know, you have Trump who, you know, I, whether you like him or don't like him, uh, the fact is, I think, in the collective psychology of the country, even for the people who hate his guts, he really represents, um, there's something about him, despite his defects, that represents a strong person, a strong man in particular. Uh, you know, for a lot of the woke generation and the woke liberal media, he represents uh, a father figure and and a kind of a malevolent father figure. And that's one of the reasons that they inveigh against him so relentlessly, because just the, you know, the, the archetypal mythological thing that he represents is so odious to them. Um, and it's curious that the Democrats have managed to come up with the exact opposite of that, you know, the weakest man conceivable. So that's kind of the picture there. And um, I didn't vote for Trump and um, I didn't vote for his opponent either in 2016. I think he's probably going to take a few blows from from the situation we're in if the situation doesn't escalate to the degree that we really get into existential trouble with our political arrangements, uh, namely, you know, that the federal government really becomes just paralyzed and irrelevant. But um, anyway, that's how I see that for the moment. Do you think this pandemic will change the way the healthcare system is structured? Uh, I mean, just yelling like Bernie, Medicare for all, it seems like that ship has sailed almost. You bet. You bet. Um, he's living in another uh, bygone world. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had a point of view about this for quite a while that is really a departure from, uh, you know, the conventional thinking. And, and what it is is as follows. Our healthcare system as we know it is a hopelessly corrupt, top-heavy racketeering operation. There's no question about it. And I think that this coronavirus episode is going to break it the same way that it's breaking the financial system. Uh, I don't think that we're going to end up in a government-sponsored Medicare for all situation because the money's not going to be there. It's as simple as that. You know, we are now watching all of the notional wealth of the Western world just evaporate into thin air. And we're not going to be able to pretend that we can borrow more because, uh, you know, a feature of that financial collapse is that the sovereign debt of all of the advanced nations is losing their legitimate, losing its legitimacy. That is to say the bonds that they issue. You know, there, there are so many hundreds of trillions of dollars of, of debt hanging over the world, not, not all over the Western world, of course, but um, the Western world has a lot of it, and the U.S. has a big portion of that. We can't really generate any, uh, you know, any more debt to run programs like that. It's absurd. So the bottom line is medicine will eventually reorganize itself emergently because uh, that's really how societies work and, and how the universe works is that you know, emergence is really the way of things. You don't just dictate some program and then, uh, you know, life accommodates it that easily. Emergence means that people and the their arrangements and the systems that they employ have to self-organize according to the circumstances that present them to them. And the circumstances presenting to us are that we don't have the money, you know, we're going broke, and that our systems for healthcare were way too complex and way too dishonest. And I think what we'll uh, eventually see where the, the place we're going to land is that medicine will once again become a local clinic based practice. Everything that is organized at the giant scale is going to fail as a result of what's going on now, including many of the big hospitals and, and uh, hospital corporations that own many hospitals. And, uh, you know, eventually medicine is going to be a local clinic based thing. It's not going to be as complex as what we have now. There will be many procedures that probably won't be available. A lot of the medicine is going to be conducted by the equivalent of physicians assistants and nurses. 
And uh, they're going to make a hell of a lot. Le- the doctors are going to make a hell of a lot less money than they're accustomed to making. You know, rather than um, having incomes like hedge funders, they're going to be back to uh, you know the way doctors were paid in uh, you know 125 years ago. You know, they may get some cash payments. They may get take a few chickens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, who knows whether credit cards will exist? But I, I, I'm a little dubious about that. But I, I think we're going to see medicine become quite a bit more primitive than it has been for us in our lifetime. Yeah, and I guess there was two questions that you kind of ask in this article, and that basically kind of touches upon one of them right there. And it was how much disorder is entailed in this ordeal, and what does the world look like when the convulsion phase of this thing is over? Um, I guess I'll, we'll talk about the former one real quick. How much disorder yeah. is entailed in this ordeal? I mean, it seems like... Well, we like certainly it, don't know, Buck. It might get worse At this point, we, before it gets better. Well, yeah, I think that we can, we can certainly, you know, a thoughtful person can certainly spin out scenarios that would be pretty uh, unpleasant and unappetizing. For example... You know, there are a lot of people, it's a well-known fact that there are vast numbers of people in this country who don't have the cash to, for any emergency to fix their car or anything. And, uh, you know, how are those people going to feed their families or feed themselves after three weeks of isolation and no income? And, and uh, you know, what happens then? So that is something worth considering. If people lose faith in the political system per se, that could be extremely problematic. You know, you have a lot of problems cropping up around the country around law enforcement. The the thing that happened in Philadelphia two days ago where the police chief there decided that they were not going to arrest and detain people who had committed felonies, you know, like like carjackings and armed robberies. You know, that's pretty weird. You can draw some conclusions or spin out some scenarios about that. So it's really a question of, you know, how, how quickly people get hungry and get desperate. And um, it's also a question of how deeply injured our institutions are. For example, uh, you know, whether we can make payments to people who are, you know, on public assistance or Social Security or any of those things. It's also a question of whether the actions of the government and the Federal Reserve right now this week, you know, pounding trillions of dollars into the banks and to other things, you know, whether that will destroy the U.S. dollar ultimately. You know, the dollar has been going up lately, but that's because of the dislocations in other currencies comparatively. And also probably an index of, of um, how damaged the European banking system is. I think a lot of money for the moment may be, you know, fleeing there into American bonds for the moment. But the bond market is itself a, a very damaged place and, a, and to some degree, a very dishonest place with mispriced securities and mispriced risk. And so that's going to all become problematical. So there's a whole kind of matrix of faith uh, in the institutions that we have built for ourselves. And as that faith incrementally dissolves, I think that we may be prone to some kind of chaos or anarchy. Yeah, it feels like there's almost this giant house of cards that's been added upon and added upon over the decades. And this, I guess we could call it the corona correction, seems to be uh, threatening to knock a lot of it down. Kind of does. What's happening with gold and silver right now? And where are we headed in that? Well, it's fallen a lot in the last week. I mean, you know, it made a high of uh, a recent high, uh, not a not a all time high, but a recent high of about sixteen hundred dollars just uh, you know ten days ago, maybe, and it's fallen two hundred dollars since then. Let's see, yeah, about two hundred dollars, I think. Excuse me, it made a high of uh, of nearly seventeen hundred dollars, and it's fallen to just under fifteen. Forgive me for that. Um, and silver has fallen by half. It's just silver has just been in the tailspin. And uh, my guess about gold is that you know it, it is a easily liquid uh, asset. So that if you own it and you need to raise money fast, you know that's a go-to thing to sell. But if everybody's selling it at once, the price goes down. And I think what's happened is that there are a lot of institutional players who uh, are selling at once uh, to make uh, margin calls and. There are a lot of people who are going broke who need to um, liquidate 
And so, you know, we're, we're seeing what happens in a general panic li- liquidation. And uh, gold is part of that. The, the difference is, is that, you know, gold, for all that has fallen in the last 10 days, it's still above where it was, uh, you know, six months ago or so. So as, a, as an asset for wealth preservation, it, it's still working. And when all of this other mischief starts to occur in things like the currency markets, and as the equity markets sink lower and lower, uh, you know, I think you'll see gold bounce back really hard. And uh, I think that's what's going to happen. So silver is partly, you know, silver is partly the same uh, and partly different. It's different because it's an industrial metal. And when you're in a situation where the entire industrial world is in lockdown and the demand for silver is just evaporates in industry, then that's going to affect uh, silver to a certain extent. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, just in the last 10 days, so many people have been buying up whatever silver remains from the, you know, the silver mint uh, of the USA that they've run out of uh, silver coins. And the premiums to get them now are just outlandish. They're like, you know, $2 premiums to buy the coins. So uh, I think you'll see silver bounce back. And in a really bad kind of worst case scenario where currencies fail and the dollar fails and people no longer have any trust in the uh, banking system, I think that you might see a situation where silver starts to be a circulating medium of exchange again, because people are going to need a medium of exchange. There's probably not quite enough to go around in the United States, maybe not, but that only means that the value of it will be greater. So that, you know, you could see prices well above $100 an ounce at some time in the you know next couple of years. So that's that's what's up with uh, gold and silver. I I can't really uh, pitch out any kind of a price for where gold may be going to, except to say that I think it's going to go a whole heck of a lot higher mm-hmm. for the same reason. Right. The second question I wanted to bring up that you mentioned in your article, because this is kind of the heart of what your article was getting at, and that is, what does the world look like when the convulsion phase of this thing is over? And I want you to talk about what big cities might look like, the changes uh, with suburbs, and all of that. Yeah, you know, I wrote several books about um, the fiasco of suburbia and the remedies for it and uh, about cities. Uh, You know, I was, uh, I still am a kind of uh, associate of the new urbanist movement, and that was a movement of architects and realtors and developers who wanted to reform the way we build things in America because, you know, we, we've thrown all of our national wealth into constructing this living arrangement that really has no future. And, um, probably the first thing that people might assume about it and notice it about it is that, you know, we're stuck with it for the moment. There's just too many Americans are stuck living in this suburban living arrangement that they're invested in, they can't get out of, you know, especially if you're in a financial crisis. I mean, who are you going to sell your house to in order to move to a small town in Michigan, you know? (laughs) That scares me. That particular line scares me. As you say that, I'm trying to sell my house in Austin and move to a small town. And uh, boy, this last two weeks have screwed me up a little bit. So they screwed the pooch for you? Uh, Well, we shall see. But uh, I apologize for interrupting there. No, no, that's all right. And um, I'm very sympathetic to that idea. You know, I, I made that choice many years ago. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm fortunate and I'm glad that I moved to where I moved. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. So, you know, we're stuck with that suburban problem and, uh, you know, people being hostage to happy motoring. And, you know, when the dust settles, it's already the case after 10 years of the middle class getting hammered that there are far fewer of them who are, who qualify for auto loans. And that's how... Americans are used to buying cars. So a lot of those people have already been foreclosed from participating in the uh, car market, but now it's going to become really extreme. And one thing that means is that all of our fantasies about saving suburbia with electric cars and self-driving cars are going to evaporate. You can just forget about all that baloney. The action, I think, is going to be moving to the, the smaller towns in America, the places that allow people to live closer together and in walkable neighborhoods. There are many tens of thousands of them. They're in pretty bad shape all over America. The disinvestment has been very, very steep in these places, including the small towns in Texas. But I think they're going to make a comeback. 
the places like that and the, the, even the smaller cities like that that are in places that have a meaningful relationship with food production will be valuable places to be because you can you can pretty much bet that agribusiness is going to get into a lot of trouble their major input for doing their activities is borrowing money you know they have, the farmers have to just raise enormous amounts of debt on these corporate mega farms in order to get those soybean crops in and those corn crops in and you know that's that's going to be a big problem when they're just when the capital all evaporates, which is what is in the process of happening now in the capital markets. So places that are near food production and, and viable for farming, places that are uh, exist at a scale that is congenial with the capital and resource realities of the future. And as far as the cities go, they are our American metroplex cities are both overscaled and at the same time kind of have had too much of an overlay of suburban fabric over them, you know. So you have places like Atlanta, which are older cities, but they've been so suburbanized on top of what was there originally that they, they're almost, uh, you know, they're going to be pretty useless. Uh, places like Houston, Dallas, you know, I think Austin is going to have some problems. I think that these these cities are all going to have to contract. They're going to have to get smaller, and the process can only be imagined as being a disorderly process. No one's going to manage that process. There will simply be kind of battles over who gets to occupy the districts of the city that retain some value. And, and these may be, for example, uh, you know, cities on the riverfronts in the Midwest, cities on the Great Lakes that have a waterfront. The coastal cities may may be problematical for you know climate reasons. I don't really know. I'm not a climate fanatic, but it's worth considering. But uh, the places in the inland America are the places that I think will be the valuable ones, especially the ones that are uh, east of the Mississippi on the inland waterway system. You know, we have the Missouri, Mississippi, Ohio River system, which is a fabulous transport network on which people will be able to move goods including goods that are produced in those regions, whether they're food goods or other kinds of products. Um, it includes the Hudson River and uh, the Champlain and Erie Canals, which connect to the Great Lakes. And it, and it includes the Great Lakes region, which is a tremendous resource, which has been almost entirely devalued over the last hundred years. You know, you go to some of these small towns on the upper peninsula of Michigan, and you see the ghosts of these shipping and fishing communities that were there in the 19th century, and it's very impressive. You know, they had a, a very robust lake economy up there that has now just been completely abandoned, and it's going to be uh, reactivated, I think. So, uh, you know, the cities have other problems. Uh, the cities that are overburdened with skyscrapers are going to be uh, in another kind of trouble because th those enormous megastructures are going to overnight become liabilities instead of assets because they'll never be renovated. They have no capacity for adaptive reuse. And cities that can't reuse their buildings and adapt them to new uses, you know, will not change and evolve to whatever whatever they're going to be in the future. You know, whatever Austin and Dallas become in the future, you know, it's not going to include their skyscrapers, really. So the cities are going to um, get smaller. They'll be considerably depopulated and there will be fights over who gets to occupy the neighborhoods and, and districts that have value. Do you think we will see a shift towards more uh, let's localized production, maybe rather than a supply chain coming from China? I don't think there's any question about that. You know, the, the only question is how that's going to happen because, you know, we're kind of running out the string on our um, energy supplies. People like to say there's a lot of oil on the ground, and there is a lot of oil on the ground, but it, we're at the point where the cost of getting it out of the ground uh, is becoming marginally not worth it. And the whole shale oil miracle was a fantastic, impressive stunt, but it was a stunt. It was a financial stunt. You know, we went from a low in the early 2000s of, of about uh, 4.5 4 million barrels a day importing about 15 million barrels a day because we were using about 20 million. And, you know, after about uh, 12 years of fracking, we're up to 13 million barrels a day in production. But it was all a kind of mirage and a, and a, a financing stunt 
accomplished with uh, you know zero interest loans. And the the key problem about shale oil was that the shale producers spent a decade proving they can't make any money producing shale oil. So they got a lot of investment in the early going for the first 10 years, and that allowed them to keep these huge production rates you know, going up and rising and going way up. But uh, now that they've demonstrated they can't get any money, they're not going to get new loans. Moreover, because the capital markets are being so damaged now, you know, there's simply going to be less capital for that. So uh, I, I think you're going to see a fairly rapid and steep decline of the shale oil business, or, or you know, maybe even more steep than than the trajectory it followed on the way up. You know, it, that was about a 12 year trajectory. It may come down in you know three or four years. There may be very little of it left. Well, there, there's also a possibility that we'll nationalize it because mm-hmm. you know there's nothing else we can do. But that. That depends on whether the federal government retains any kind of coherence and and legitimacy and the faith of the people and any financial mojo to do that because we've squandered our, you know, we've really squandered our financial mojo uh, by running up so much debt. So then the question becomes, you know, how do we produce stuff in this country again? And the simple answer is probably not along the lines of a 1965 model, you know? I think a lot of it will probably involve water power and hydroelectric, but it'll be on a much smaller scale than anything we're used to. You know, the factories of the future are going to be much smaller. They're not going to be robotic. You know, a lot of the super duper high tech stuff that people have been fantasizing over just ain't going to happen. And, um, you know, it's going to be a a much more austere economy. You were speaking a while ago of basically we can't afford, we, I don't like to say we, I should say, I like to separate us from the government. The government can't afford all of this stuff. And it reminded me of something Ron Paul used to say quite a bit was the troop presence around the world is going to come to an end for sure at some point because the government can no longer afford to keep the troops in all these countries across the world. Do you think we're nearing that point as well? Yeah, I, the simple answer is yeah. Self-evident. You know, we're kind of in the same... Uh, situation that the Roman Empire was in mm-hmm. in the year, you know, 380 AD when their far-flung defense lines and, you know, in up in the German nations of Northern Europe, you know, those, those defense lines were falling apart and couldn't be defended and they had to withdraw and, you know, all over the empire. And, I, you know, it's a similar thing. It's not, it's not all that complicated. Right. Now, you know, what, what kind of, what kind of disorder that entails with all these, uh, uh, warring nations out there who we have been, you know, supposedly and presumably uh, protecting them and ourselves from and each other from, uh, you know, who knows what happens with, uh, you know, the Saudi Arabians and the Iranians and all those folks out there. But we're losing the mojo to exert our influence there and project our power. And we're going to have to come to terms with that somehow. You know, w- w- one of one of the possible outcomes of this is that we'll see some kind of military, um, I don't know what the word is, it, I don't want to use a paranoid word, but you know, the military may impose itself on the government and start making decisions for it. And I think people understand what I mean by that. Right. It, it's conceivable. I'm not saying that it's, you know, a for sure thing or anything, but it could happen. You mentioned earlier, uh, you touched upon the quote unquote woke left. And it seems like one of the things I, I hope will change is some of the ridiculous narrative uh, that politics has had in the last year or two. Do you think the talking points from the woke left, all of the uh, obsession with identity politics and, and white male privilege and, and, and phrases like that, what happens with all of this kind of debate? Will it have run its course too and there's no room for it? Personally, I think it's going to go up in a vapor so fast it'll make your head spin. You know, I, I think that when people, when it really comes down to it and people are really stressed and really anxious and really worried about their existential future, uh, they're not going to have any time for this nonsense. And, you know, to many of us in America, it already seemed like the most errant nonsense imaginable, you know, even before the market started wobbling and coronavirus hit the scene. But now it's going to seem like just utter absurdity. <laughs> and, um, I think that 
It will be gone as quickly as the ideas of the Jacobins evaporated in 1793 in France. Mm -hmm. You know what happened there, um, and I wrote about this in my in my latest book. I, I have a new book out called "Living in the Long Emergency," in case readers are stuck home alone and want to get it on Kindle. Um, anyway, what happened in uh, 1793, which I wrote about, you know, the Jacobins took over the French government, and they were such utter ideological extremists, you know, they believed in, you know, a lot of the similar nutty things as the woke left. And they imposed their will on the people of France and ended up executing about 18,000 citizens, largely because, you know, what they were really about was simply coercion, which is the same thing that the wokesters are really about. They're not really about social justice. At the core of their program is simply the uh, pleasure of pushing other people around and telling them what to do mm -hmm. and telling them what to think, you know, and, and, and all of that, uh, you know, gender and race hustling that goes on around it is simply window dressing for what is essentially a power play uh, and a very ugly one, you know, a, a power play simply for the sheer pleasure, the simple sadistic pleasure of pushing people around. And um, that, you know, the Jacobins were themselves uh, arrested and executed. That was uh, Robespierre and his deputy, uh, Saint-Just. You know, they were rounded up and executed. The Jacobins were kicked out of the National Assembly, and they were never heard of again. And their program went up, you know, uh, evaporated. And nobody ever talked about their crap again. And that's exactly what you're going to see with uh, the social justice and race hustle. Yeah, it's, it's uh, when things tend to get actually serious. And one of the problems is, I, I, I say problem, it hasn't been truly serious for decades here because we almost have an embarrassment of riches. And That's absolutely right. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, I think when some of that goes away, you don't have the quote-unquote privilege of walking around trying to prove how woke you are and how sensitive you are to the 0.0001% of the population and, uh, and maybe yeah, you, you can't put on, you know, you can't devote your life to making moral de demonstrations of your, your goodness and rectitude, right. you know, and, and how evil everybody else is. I mean, that's just a stupid parlor game, really. You know, the amazing thing is that the universities became infested with these idiots. Yes. And, uh, you know, the universities have all shut down for the, uh, semester now for the year, really. And uh, I think that's the first stage in the university and college system really going through a very painful collapse. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these places are not going to survive. Uh, and a lot of the big state institutions and even, you know, big well-endowed private institutions are going to be lesser things than they were. And I hope one of the first things they do is clean out the faculties of all of these wokester idiot nuts. Yes, well put. Uh, do you think this change was bound to happen at some point in the corona virus is just the needle that happened to bust the bubble? Yeah, the simple answer is yes. Uh, and in fact, you know, a lot of people are arguing right now in the web that, you know, the financial part of this story really started back in the summer of 2019 and really started to get hairy in the fall when the Federal Reserve had to step in with all these overnight repo operations that, you know, required tens of billions of dollars and were, was being done very surreptitiously all through the fall and the, and the holiday season. And then, you know, we come around the new year and all of a sudden, you know, we got a really serious financial problem already underway when coronavirus hit. But when coronavirus hit and the main a result of that was the shutdown virtually of the entire global production economy. You know, th that's what really did it. That's what really blew it up because we faced the prospect that, you know, nothing would be made and nothing would be bought and sold. And, you know, that's what an advanced economy is about. Right. So, yeah. So, the, the, yeah, that's the answer. The, and, and also, Buck, you know, as you know, as you well know, the deformities of the financial system have been in place and have been worked so sedulously for the last, uh, you know, 10, 20 years and have been accruing and building up and, and compounding, you know, so to the extent that all the functions of markets have been so perverted, you know, that the, 
the real price of everything just has become completely obfuscated. So, uh, you know, the, the correction that's going on now is a massive price correction, uh, you know, what everything's value really is in the real world. So the, the, basically the platform of fantasy that it was all perched on was pulled out from under it very suddenly. And it's all in kind of free fall now. Off the top of your head, before we go, I want to ask you this, what lesson uh, for everyone listening right now, what lesson do you hope is learned from this yeah, whole mess, we'll call it? Well, you know, I'm not sure that human societies, groups of people learn lessons in the way that we want them to learn lessons as, as though they were all in a chemistry class and, you know, they came away with some really valuable lifelong nugget of wisdom. As, as I said earlier in the show, you know, life is emergent and people respond emergently to the circumstances that reality presents. But uh, there are some themes that also present that are worth thinking about for Americans. And they are as follows. You know, you got to think about uh, what part of the country you're going to live in and, and whether it can really support some kind of a viable economy in the years ahead. You know, if you are in a place like Tucson, you know, you better think hard about staying in Tucson. Uh, if you're in a big city, if you're in Brooklyn, up in New York State, if you're, you know, if you're in uh, Los Angeles or San Francisco, you better have some second thoughts. You know, Seattle. Uh, those places are going to probably be in a whole new kind of trouble that they've never seen before, have no experience with. And a lot of it is going to involve simply a lack of, of capital to run their systems. People will be wise to consider what kind of activities they can put their energy into, their personal energy. So, you know, what kind of jobs or vocations or, or skills they can acquire and use to make themselves useful to other people for the years ahead. Probably not getting a degree in marketing from uh, Texas A&M, you know, stuff like that is probably not going to be too too valuable. But if you can learn how to, you know, fix a refrigerator or plow a furrow and raise a crop, you know, w without borrowing seven hundred thousand dollars to do it, um, that'll be very valuable. So you know, you got to find a place to live. You got to find a thing to devote your energy to. You've got to be. You got to uh, actually. Work at building a community wherever you land, you know, uh, build up the favor bank with other people, build your, the esteem that people will hold you in, in your community so that, you know, you will, you will be valued in that community. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be tough and a bit harsh and it's going to take some courage and, uh, energy and, and we're going to get on with it, whether we like it or not. Jim, talk about your, uh, your webpage and your blog and uh, where can the listeners find your media, basically? All righty. Uh, my name is James Howard Kunstler. The German name it means artist, by the way. Uh, my website is kunstler.com. I was lucky to get that in the early days. My blog comes out every Monday and Friday morning at 10 o'clock Eastern time uh, without fail. And it's usually pretty funny and interesting. And remember what old Samuel Beckett, the playwright, once said, Nothing is funnier than unhappiness. So this is a pretty unhappy time. And, uh, you know, there'll be, there'll be quite a bit to laugh at as well as, uh, you know, wring your hands over. So uh, I put out a blog, too, about every three weeks or so. And I'm not a blog, a podcast of my own every three weeks. And I usually interview some interesting cat. And um, I've published about 23 books. And uh, many of them are on display on my website, Kunstler.com. And um, I have a new book out right now. It is a sequel to my 2005 book, The Long Emergency, which was about exactly this kind of scenario. And this one is called Living in the Long Emergency. I wrote it during 2017, 18. So, you know, I was anticipating that we were getting closer to some kind of an event. And here we are. It was published on March 10th, I believe, right at the as soon as this thing really started taking off. So. Wow. You know, my timing is pretty good, except for the fact that uh, all American retail is closed up and <laughs> there are so few bookstores left anyway. Right. But there, you know, there are there are some left and and some of the independents will, uh, you know, will mail you a book. Well, of course, I would link to this page in the show notes page for this episode. James Howard Kunstler, Thanks. thank you so much for uh, being here and your your writings and, and all of that are quite timely. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Buck.
All right, I hope you guys enjoyed that chat with James Howard Kunstler. Like I said, I'm going to bring you many episodes that uh, will discuss the topics around the coronavirus as well as the virus itself. And I, I want to give you kind of a original, unique take on things, not just the boring stuff you're going to hear from your friends that are bored at home on Facebook. So look forward to the next several episodes. You might have noticed the sound quality on this podcast is, uh, dare I say, damn near perfect. And I can say that because I'm not bragging on myself at all. I'm bragging on my friend Chris Williams over at Podsworth Media. They can be found at podsworth.com. So if you've got a podcast you've got out and you think if it just sounded like Death to Tyrants or the Tom Woods Show or the Bob Murphy Show, well, then I've got the fix for you. Go over to podsworth.com and pay them a visit and let Chris know, hey, I want my product to sound great like these other ones you put out. And uh, he will let you know what to do from there. Again, that's podsworth.com. Chris Williams makes this damn thing sound damn good. So you can find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash death to tyrants podcast. You can follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. Let's see, patreon.com slash death to tyrants is where you can donate to the show. And uh, until next week, I will see you guys later. Be safe out there and uh, have a good one. Fucking half, cause I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Death to Tyrants podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.